This lecture is entitled IP Routing, an Administrator's Survival Guide. You'll notice it doesn't say a Unix Administrator's Guide or a Linux Administrator's Guide. We happen to be using Linux for all the routing this week. But the fundamentals are the same no matter what OS we use. Now let's do a little bit of review from your IP course. IP routing is very simple. It's one of the reasons it works so well. The I in IP stands for inter. I think it's important to remember that inter implies connecting a number of networks. Each IP address is made up of two parts, a network and a node. So the first part of the IP address basically says, what's my neighborhood? Who are my neighbors? We're all on the same network. If I'm on the same network, I can talk to the other nodes directly. When we take two or more of these networks and hook them together with a router, we get it, we get an internet. We're going to use subnet masks to define that split between network and node. This guy's only going to talk about IPv4. More review, I think. The IP address consists of 32 bits, and we normally group them as four octets. Right, 255, 255, 255, 255 being the maximum. So the first N bits are the network portion. The remainder is the node portion. I think that's review. We define that split between network and node with a net mask. If we don't provide a net mask, it is assumed based on, the, based on the class of address, but we're always going to use a net mask. Here's a graphical representation of how the net mask works. On our private network, starting with a 10, we can choose where we put the net mask. In the first example, we have a slash 24 for a 24-bit net mask, which means 8, 16, 24. So the first three octets determine the network, and the last one is the node. What's the maximum number of nodes we could have on this network that I have highlighted? Yes, Ryan, 255. It depends. Um, some old routers, some old IP gear would complain if there was a zero in the address and it wouldn't work. So, but new ones allow a zero. So I think it is 255 actually. I think we can do dot zeros. If we change the net mass to 16, we now have 256 times 256 for the nodes. So we have a lot more space for nodes. We just have fewer space for net, less space for networks. Okay. It's a busy slide. There's a lot on there. Let's pack it apart or pull it apart slowly. Every time a node has a packet to send. Okay. Remember, a node is just a computer. It's network speak for a computer. So every time a node has a packet to send, that's an IP packet. It's got to decide 
whether it's going to send the packet directly to the destination node or through a router. It's really the only choices it has. If we're on the same subnet, we're going to send it directly. I just slipped in the word subnet and I've only been talking about networks. For our discussions, a network is the same as a subnet. When we hook them together, it becomes an internetwork. So let's see what happens when we're sending a packet directly. The first thing we do on our sender is send out an ARP request. You may remember the ARP. Address Resolution Protocol. And it's a broadcast. So it's going to go to all the nodes on the network. It's a simple request. It says, does anyone have the MAC address for this IP address? Somebody answers, they're going to be the destination. So the destination node says, oh yeah, that's for me. Here's my MAC address. The source node then builds an IP packet. This is a little bit wrong. The IP packet doesn't change. It takes the IP packet and puts it in an ethernet packet. The ethernet packet needs a MAC address for the destination. What destination does it use for the MAC address? The one it got in step two. Maybe we can see that in a diagram. So S01's got a packet to send to W01. First thing S01 does is send out a broadcast, an ARP, that basically says, who is 101110? W01's Ethernet card and stack sitting there going, oh, that's me. I know who that is. So W01 responds, I am 101110, and my MAC address is blah, 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 37. S01 takes that information and says, ah, now I can deliver my IP packet. I put it inside an Ethernet packet with the Ethernet destination of W01. What happens, though, when we're on a different network? We've already solved this problem. We put in a router. Let's look at a similar diagram when there's a router involved. Where are we? Here's S02. S02 is going to send a packet. It's done a little bit of the preliminary work first. Here's what the packet looks like, and it's an interesting trick. We'll notice that the destination MAC address is not W01's MAC address. It's R01 yellow MAC address. See how this guy matches this guy? But look at the IP packet. Who's the source? That makes sense. It's S02. 10 to 130. But you'll notice the destination on the IP packet is not the router. I don't change the IP packet source or destination through the routing process. Packet stays the packet. What I do is this little trick. I put in the MAC address of the router. Packet goes out on the wire. This Ethernet card says, hey, that's my MAC address. It's for me. Pulls the packet off the wire, passes it up to IP. Well, what comes up to the IP layer? Just the IP packet. Now our IP stack says, hmm, source, 
This is from 10 to 130. Very well. It's going to 10, 1, 1, 10. Now, I'm not 10, 1, 1, 10. This packet is not for me. So now I've got three choices. The lazy choice. I can say, packet's not for me. Drop it. I can say, packet's not for me. I'm going to send some sort of response and let the guy, let S02 know he's, he's next up. Or I can be a good neighbor. I can say S02 sent me this packet. It's not for me. But it looks like it's for one of my other neighbors. It's for somebody on the 10 1 network. Oh, I know about the 10 1 network. Maybe I'll try and send that along for my friend. I don't change the IP packet. Source and destination stay the same. You'll notice this IP packet does not say it's coming from the router. The IP packet says it's coming from S02. But we put on W01's MAC address. Now we've got a MAC address and a destination that match. W01's going to pick the packet up and handle it. That's pretty much what happened. As we saw, because there's no little breadcrumb or history that gets tacked on to the packet to say how it went, it's up to W01 to find some way to get a packet back to S02 if it has a response. So W01 then has to have its routing set up correctly. Let's look at simplified routing tables. Right? This isn't the format that they're going to be stored in or exactly the way they're going to look when you run a command. But I would think most network people and most admins would understand this if I said, here's a routing table. A routing table is how the IP stack decides where to send a packet next. Simple as that. It's got two columns. Where is it going? How do I send it there? We just start at the top and work our way down until we find a match. On S02, if the packet is going to the 10.2.1 network, I send it out F0. I send it right out my hardware. If it's going to any other network, I send it to R01. Similarly, down on W01, we have a local connection to blue. But if we're going to go to yellow, we need to send it through the router. Interestingly, there's no fancy routing done on the router. In our scenario, because our router is connected to every network it knows about or cares about, we don't ever have to do a route command or set up any special routes. All we need are the ones that we get for free when we turn up the interfaces. Little history lesson. Previous versions of Linux called the devices F0 and F1. What do we call, what does CentOS 8 call the, the cards? I'll tell you, ENP0S3. F0 and F1 are nice because they're short to type and no matter what your hardware is, they're always going to be zero and one. 
Problem is, if your hardware moves around or your drivers change, the naming can get messed up and zero can become one. And that's bad. So now the strategy is to map those device names to a hardware path. That's why the EN P0S3. All right, consider S02 sends a packet to W01. So S02 has got a packet for W01, 10.1.1.10. Looks at his routing table. Does that match? No. Therefore, oh, default. Default matches everything. I'm going to send the packet to R01. R01 gets the packet. Is it for me? Nope. But I'm a router. Is it for anybody I know about? Sure it is. It's for W01 over on the blue network. I'm going to send it to, oh, well, wait a minute. Let's just do the math. Um, doesn't match. Matches. So I'm going to send the packet out my Ethernet zero. Simply put, the routing table has two possible destinations, a network or the default. So you get one wild card, say network one, network one, everything else. The default always needs to point toward the open internet. If you have a choice between the explicit routes and a default route, the default's the one that needs to point toward the internet because there's no way I can realistically keep track of every network on the internet I want to talk to and how to forward. I just can't do that. So we're going to use somebody else's router on the internet. That means the default chain of routers has to point out. You'll see that maybe a little in the lab. Well, we did when we do W01, right? W01 has a default that points to the world and explicit routes that point internally. Let me go back and make sure I didn't miss anything. Ah, the destination column is a, contains a list of networks, right? Where are we sending it? A network or the default? Only one default allowed. And in the destination, or the root, sorry, the root. Where's it going? What's its root? The root, there's only two choices. You can send it out an interface card or you can send it to a router. Really very simple, but can be put together in a very robust way, especially when we add dynamic routing protocols. What makes a Linux or Unix system a router? Well, we have to turn on IP forwarding. The, the original IP stack, I, in most cases, did forwarding by default. For security reasons, we turn that off. When we're going to use it. We got to turn it on. Oops. The only new information on this slide is that most nodes have only local routes and a default router. So you're gonna, as an admin, 99% of the time, the way you're gonna put a system on the internet is, or the company network, you're gonna fill out a form and give it to the networking group what the server is, where it lives, what it does, what color network you want to be on. And they'll reply in seven to 10 business days with an IP address, a net mask, and the name of your, the, the IP address of your default router and your DNS, but mainly the default router. 
right? You'll get an IP address and a default router from them. And I was joking about the seven to 10 days, but only a little bit. Those guys can be, it can take a while sometimes. Well, here's an interesting exercise that I'm not gonna do, but you might enjoy. Produce the routing tables for each node in the graded lab. So just draw little, little tables like this, piece of paper or a note, or however you wanna draw them, for each of these guys. No grades, but it'll help. Especially if you're having any trouble with the lab. If you draw out those routing tables and like try and play network. Here's my packet, where do I send it? I personally, I find it really helps to put myself in the shoes of the system. So here's what the system's been given, what can it do? I'm going to stop the recording because we've 